Mustafa Kemal. He calls himself Ataturk, father of the Turks, and catapults Turkey into the modern age. One of his greatest achievements was making women visible. He knows no mercy for himself or for others. I'm not a dictator. I want to rule by capturing the hearts of the people, not by breaking them. A controversial hero, both loved and hated. Is present-day Turkey still divided by Ataturk's revolution? The First World War. The Ottoman Empire allies itself with the German Empire and Austria-Hungary against France, Russia, and Great Britain. One of modern history's most brutal battles takes place off Turkey's Mediterranean coast. Allied warships attempt to pass through the Dardanelles Strait and reach Istanbul, but they fail. This gives rise to a new Allied strategy and an opportunity for Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. The Allied forces attack the Gallipoli Peninsula with infantry sparking a static battle that lasts for months. The young Ottoman officer, Mustafa Kemal, is in command of an entire section of the front. One of his orders from the trenches goes down in history. Your brave mothers gave birth to you for this day alone. I order you not to attack. I order you to die. In the time that it takes us to die, others will rise up to take our place. Attention! Attack! Although his troops are outnumbered, Ataturk is able to hold his position until reinforcements arrive. There's no doubt that he was decisively involved in repelling the invading troops at two significant positions. But the overall military strategy was developed by the German general Liman von Sanders. To this day, Turkey celebrates Ataturk as the great hero of Gallipoli. There are many monuments to his bravery across the country. In Gallipoli, the Ottoman Empire achieves one final victory, but at great cost. Almost half its soldiers fall in battle. Their sacrifice cannot stop the inexorable downfall of the empire. The Ottomans rule Southeast Europe and large parts of the Arab world for centuries. In the 19th century, the empire becomes known as the sick man of Europe. In 1908, the Ottoman Empire loses Bosnia and Herzegovina to the Habsburgs. That same year, Bulgaria declares its independence. Three years later, in 1911, Tripoli is lost to the Italians. And in 1914, Egypt officially becomes a British protectorate. The disintegration of the empire was not in doubt. The question for the government in Istanbul and the Ottoman people was, could this process be stopped or prevented? The future Mustafa Kemal Ataturk is born into the crumbling multicultural empire in 1881 in a house in Thessaloniki. At the time, the city is known as Selenik and is under Ottoman control. The death of his pro-European father at an early age deeply affects the young man, and he enrolls in the military academy against his mother's wishes. He soon develops a reputation as a good student and is given the name Kemal, which means the mature or the accomplished. 
The extraordinary thing about Mustafa Kemal is that he became aware of the difficult situation women faced at a young age. His mother was a single parent, a widow, and he had two sisters. He knew the challenges his mother faced. Because of his experiences, he became an officer preoccupied with the rights and equality of women. Thessaloniki remains a part of the Ottoman Empire until 1912. The harbour city on the Mediterranean attracts Jews, Turks, Armenians, Greeks, the British and Italians. The liberal atmosphere of this city leaves a lasting impression on Mustafa Kemal. It had a newspaper industry, a publishing industry and many foreigners. There were even Germans in Thessaloniki who had their own breweries and bowling clubs. It was a very multinational, Western-oriented society. Atatürk continues his career at the renowned Ottoman Military Academy in Istanbul. Training at the academy is heavily influenced by Prussian military theory, as the Germans had been responsible for modernizing the Ottoman Empire's military schools. This environment gives rise to the Young Turks movement, based around an ambitious, nationalistic and Western-oriented military elite. Now a young officer, Mustafa Kemal becomes part of the movement, attracted by its ideas of liberal reform. He's fascinated by the ideals of the French Revolution. Mustafa Kemal Mustafa Kemal saw, heard and felt the overwhelming technical and scientific superiority of Europe every day. The model for him was not a single country like Germany, France or England, but the West as a whole. The Young Turks are determined to save the Ottoman Empire. Led by Enver Pasha, they demand political and military reforms. In 1908, the Young Turks take power in Istanbul, ousting Sultan Abdul Hamid II and replacing him with his brother. In order to stop the collapse of the fragile empire, Enver Pasha joins forces with the Germans in the First World War. In the course of the war, Atatürk becomes an adversary of the ambitious war minister. He sees Enver Pasha as an obstacle to his own advancement. Both are patriots, but while Enver assumes an elitist approach, Atatürk believes in winning the support of the masses. Have been signed under difficult conditions. Many years later, he recalls those days. Only a Turkish nation in arms can overcome the country's crisis. Soldiers not acquainted with Timur, Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun will prove useless in combat. While Atatürk becomes a hero at Gallipoli, the war minister Enver Pasha suffers a catastrophic defeat at the Ottoman-Russian front. By the spring of 1917, there's no longer any doubt that the world war will bring about the end of the Ottoman Empire. Enver Pasha orders Mustafa Kemal to accompany the Crown Prince on a visit to the German allies. The delegation stops in Strasbourg on the way to inspect the Western Front. The Ottoman allies meet with an icy reception from the German imperial governor Hans von Dalwitz, who is incensed by a recent chapter of Ottoman warfare. Your Highness, General, Sirs. Two years earlier, the Young Turks, under the leadership of Enver Pasha, had used problems along the Ottoman-Russian front as a pretext for brutally persecuting the Armenians. They accused them of collaborating with the enemy and ordered they be deported to the Syrian desert. There were Armenians in Anatolia before there were Turks there. We know this. 
People speak of genocide, but the Ottomans and the Armenians were at war. This remains the official Turkish position to this day. However, a majority of those deported are civilians, women, children and old men. Almost all of them die on the forced marches. Internationally, it is deemed genocide. But how does Ataturk feel about the treatment of the Armenians? Ataturk was lucky that he was fighting English, Australian and New Zealand soldiers in 1915 and wasn't sent to Anatolia. That meant he was the only prominent figure among the young Turks who was not contaminated by those events. Your Highness, disturbing news has reached my ears. The Armenians are good, gentle people. Your countrymen have been engaged in terrible assaults. How could you possibly presume to take the side of the Armenians who claim to have existed as a nation and now hope to prove their own worth again, thereby harming the Turkish Empire? One hears disturbing things, but We of course... did not come here to discuss the Armenian question, but rather to determine the strength of the German army. We stake our lives on your troops. We are relying on you. Gentlemen, please. Dalwitz is one of the few politicians who speaks up about the deportation of the Armenians. The German ambassador in Istanbul also lodges a protest. Betman Holweg, the German chancellor, merely replies, our only aim is to keep Turkey at our side until the end of the war, irrespective of whether it costs Armenian lives or not. Mustafa Kemal had gewusst Mustafa Kemal knew that nobody would deny that the Armenians were subjected to incredible suffering. Whether it was controlled by Istanbul or local gangs, members of the military or the police, that was clear. Mustafa Kemal returns to Central Europe shortly before the war ends, traveling to Kalavivari or Karlsbad in Bohemia to recuperate from a kidney infection in June 1918. Despite the war, Karlsbad has remained an important meeting place for Europe's high society. The therapeutic qualities of the thermal baths are not the only attraction in the city. The cosmopolitan atmosphere in Karlsbad leaves a powerful impression on Mustafa Kemal. This is how he imagines a modern society must be. The war hero is particularly taken by the city's women. They are confident, independent, and they do not wear veils. We must be bold when it comes to the question of women. They should fill their spirits with art and science. Let us teach women the value of education and virtue so that they may maintain their honor. Shortly after Ataturk's return, the Ottoman Empire's participation in World War I ends in defeat. Allied forces occupy large parts of the country in November of 1918. The Peace Treaty of Sèvres, signed on the 10th of August 1920, reduces the once mighty empire to a thinly populated section of land in Anatolia. The Greeks have preemptively occupied Izmir and continue to advance inland. Sèvres is the Turkish Versailles. However, Versailles at least accorded the Germans the potential to be a large power. This was not the case with Sèvres, which demanded the dismantling of the empire. Sèvres signified the end. Ataturk considers the Sèvres negotiations an unmitigated disaster. Long before an agreement is reached, he launches his campaign against the dictated freedom from the coastal town of Samsun. 
Ataturk already had a plan for a future Turkey laid out. Ataturk had been sent to Samsun with orders to supervise the demobilization of troops. Instead, he refuses to follow the orders of the government in Istanbul and calls on the Muslim population to resist the Greeks. This provocation leads to his dismissal from the army. In absentia, he and his comrade Ismet Pasha, later Ismet Enunu, are sentenced to death by Istanbul's military court. Ataturk refuses to give in. He calls on his supporters to attend congresses in Ezerum and Sivas in order to establish an alternative government. After our victory, the country will be governed as a republic. The Sultan and the dynasty will be dealt with as necessary when the time comes. The veil will be abolished, as will the Fez. People will wear hats, as they do in civilized nations. There were a lot of men like Ataturk, military leaders who became politicians between World War I and World War II. In Hungary, there was Admiral Horthy, and in Spain, you had General Franco. But Ataturk was the only head of state with a military background who cut spending for the armed forces and invested the money in education and health in order to heal the nation's wounds. A new state requires a new capital city. A small, largely insignificant administrative center becomes the Ankara of the modern era. Ataturk remains a powerful presence in the city. On the 23rd of April, 1920, Mustafa Kemal opens Turkey's first Grand National Assembly. The new parliament declares the Treaty of Sèvres void and the government representatives in Istanbul guilty of high treason. The opposition parliament then signs a contract with the Bolsheviks in Russia. The Soviet Union is the first country to recognize the new government and sends money and weapons for the fight against the Greek occupiers. Two years later, Mustafa Kemal's troops will have recaptured most of Turkey. In July of 1921, Ataturk assumes command of the war against the occupying forces. Once again, he proves himself a master strategist. He declares general mobilization, demanding that every Turkish citizen contribute to the production of arms and ammunition. Even women transport shells to the front line. This highly motivated army under Mustafa Kemal's command eventually defeats the Greeks resoundingly at the Battle of Sakarya. Ataturk is given the honorary title Ghazi, the Conqueror. In 1922, Ataturk ends his war against the Greek occupiers in Izmir on the Aegean coast. This also marks a significant turning point in his personal life. The city falls to the Turkish army without resistance. Looting breaks out in Christian areas of the city. A fire begins in the Armenian quarter and becomes a conflagration, forcing local inhabitants to flee. Ten days later, the Christian areas have burned to the ground. Could Ataturk have prevented this? When Ataturk arrived in Izmir, he had defeated the Greeks. My opinion is this. Why would a person who enters a city victorious then set fire to that city? As far as I can see, the fires could only have been set by those escaping, and there are documents that back this up. However, it is not an indisputable claim. Nobody can now deny that not only the Greek inhabitants of Izmir, but also between one and two hundred thousand Greek refugees were literally forced onto the ships. 
However, we've been unable to establish conclusively who was responsible for the destruction of the city by arson. The fact that Mustafa Kemal himself remained silent on the issue suggests that the army was involved. In Izmir, Mustafa Kemal establishes his headquarters in a villa owned by the Ushakizade family, successful local merchants. Latife, the family's daughter, had pledged to marry the man who freed Izmir from the Greeks. Such a beautiful, elegant woman wears the image of a mere soldier around her neck. My Pasha, I had it made only recently. The day the two of them met was very dramatic. There was the great fire and the beginning of their love. Are houses of your family affected by the fire? Yes, many. Yet all we own shall burn, my Pasha. We have defeated the enemy, and under your leadership we will build a new Izmir. The couple are drawn together by passion and patriotism. Turkish sources suggest that the events in Izmir cost 10,000 lives, while Greek sources claim there were as many as 100,000 deaths, possibly one-third of Izmir's total population. Of the Armenian inhabitants, only a few individuals survived. Some desperate people are able to escape to the Greek islands the Allied ships in the harbor refuse to intervene or come to their aid. Centuries of multicultural, multi-ethnic existence in the city come to an end. Izmir becomes a Turkish city. The victory celebrations across the country represent a triumph for the young state. Mustafa Kemal becomes a shining hero in the eyes of Turkey's population, once and for all. The reconquest of Turkey's former territories makes the Treaty of Sèvres worthless, forcing the Allies to return to the negotiating table. Eventually, Turkey's new government signs the Treaty of Lausanne, which negates many of the Sèvres conditions, on the 24th of July, 1923. The treaty effectively legalizes the expulsion of unwelcome sections of the population in order to turn the former multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire into a Turkish nation-state. This leads to the greatest population exchange the world had so far witnessed. Hundreds of thousands of people are affected. Large columns of Greeks who had been citizens of the Ottoman Empire flee Turkey while Muslims from Thrace and Macedonia make their way to the new Turkish state. And many more nationalities are affected. One mustn't forget that there were also large numbers of refugees and people resettled from the Balkans and the Caucasus who made up the new nation. It wasn't only people born in Anatolia. There are experts who claim that in Turkey, it wasn't the people who formed the nation, but the state which effectively created the nation from the top down. Ataturk's government in Ankara banishes the last Sultan, Mehmed VI, and subsequently all members of the House of Osman. The Republic is declared on the 29th of October 1923, and Ataturk is named president. However, Mustafa Kemal has not yet achieved his ultimate goal, a cultural revolution within Turkey. As president, he is determined to make his Karlsbad ideas a reality. The first step the long-term bachelor takes is to marry Latifa Hanim, his ideal of what a modern woman should be despite the fact that she wears a headscarf in public out of respect for local traditions.
Ataturk's plans for a Western-style civil marriage ceremony are dashed by the laws of the Ottoman Empire, which are still in effect. However, he immediately changes the position of women in society, with Latifa's help. Latifa's role in the reforms consisted of her accompanying Mustafa Kemal wherever he went. Up until this point, all male leaders or padishahs went everywhere alone, without their wives. Mustafa Kemal and Latifa went everywhere together. I think that was the biggest reform, and I'm a little sorry that this is often ignored. Latifa had studied in Paris and speaks fluent German. She transforms Ataturk's former bachelor nights into European-style middle-class dinner parties. Women are also invited to attend. Bravo, Latifa. Bravo. Few of Ataturk's cultural reforms had quite the long-term success of his efforts to introduce gender equality. In modern-day Turkey, women are to be found in all professions, and they are far more emancipated than in other Muslim societies. The foundation for today's equality lies with Turkey's adoption of the Swiss Civil Code in 1925. Five years later, women are given the vote in Turkey, long before France and Switzerland introduce universal suffrage. The most important changes that women hoped for were the abolition of polygamy and the right to divorce their husbands. After the introduction of the Swiss Civil Code, men and women enjoyed the same rights. All women benefited, whether they preferred the Western or the Eastern way of life, whether they were for headscarves or against them. Many women campaigned for these rights and even fought for them. The civilized evenings of piano recitals and Victor Hugo quotes soon vanish. Replaced by the raki soaked men's nights Mustafa Kemal is renowned for. To the Republic, to our independence. To the Republic. What is this? You are drinking again. Your doctor and your mother have warned you. You shouldn't drink so much. My mother is dead, but you, you restrict me. Control every step I take. You are the president. This is about Turkey. For me, it's about my freedom. Why didn't Latife just go along with everything like other women did? Why did she contradict him so often? Latife's independence caused consternation and irritated the people around her. In addition, Mustafa Kemal had spent the formative years of his life alone and was a man who valued his freedom. He realized that Latife was restricting him. Ataturk divorces Latife in accordance with Islamic law, just before the Swiss Civil Code would have made this impossible. The divorced wife of Turkey's first president spends the rest of her life living quietly in Istanbul and Izmir. Despite the divorce, Ataturk longs for a family. He adopts eight orphans in the course of his life and makes sure to raise his adopted daughters as emancipated and patriotic women. One girl with an Armenian background eventually becomes a fighter pilot and flies missions against the Kurds. Istanbul on the Bosporus and the Sea of Marmara.
Ataturk feels almost omnipresent here. Even though President Erdogan's new mosque now towers above the Republic Monument on the city's renowned Taksim Square. Modern-day Turkey is a divided nation, torn between Europe and the Islamic world. This fundamental conflict dates back to the Ataturk era. All the reforms the president of the new republic introduces pursue a single goal, to bring an underdeveloped Turkey closer to Europe. This comes at a high price, internal divisions within the country. As soon as the Republic is declared, Mustafa Kemal attempts to turn Turkey into a secular country with a clear separation between religion and the state. The Caliphate is abolished in 1924. Quran schools and Sharia courts are subsequently closed down, followed a year later by Sufi orders and dervish monasteries. The Quran itself is translated into Turkish. The Hagia Sophia, a Christian church until 1453, was the main mosque throughout Ottoman rule. In 1934, as the final flourish of his religious reforms, Ataturk has it converted to a museum. The protests against this move continue to this day. Basically, his answer was atheism. Because he himself had no need for religion and no interest in mysticism, he had no understanding that some people needed transcendental beliefs of one kind or another. Ataturk also hopes to change the outward appearance of his subjects, making Turks look more like Europeans. His clothing reform forces his compatriots to abandon their fezes and kaftans. These changes also have a religious element. In Anatolia, the hat is seen as a symbol of godlessness. The hat law of 1925 attracts more criticism than the abolishment of the caliphate the year before. There are uprisings, and some people who refuse to abandon their traditional fez headwear are sentenced to death. That same year, parts of the Kurdish population begin to demand autonomy. Ataturk refuses, although the Kurds had supported him during his war for independence. The Kurdish leader, Sheikh Said, calls for rebellion and demands the revival of the caliphate. The government suppresses the rebellion brutally, sending the Sheikh and 47 of his followers to the gallows. Secularism and the Kurdish question both continue to play an important and divisive role in Turkey's internal politics to this day. In 1924, the regime began to crack down. In the wake of the Kurdish rebellion in 1925, all opposition parties were silenced and the press was placed under government control. Turkey became a single-party state one could call a dictatorship. Ataturk often considered changing from a one-party to a multi-party system, similar to that of the French, but it simply wasn't possible. Resistance against Ataturk and his reforms grows, even among his former associates. In the summer of 1926, a group of conspirators plans to assassinate the president. But the plan is uncovered, and a wave of arrests takes place across the country. It is the perfect opportunity for Ataturk to remove his opponents, whether they are guilty of a crime or not. My Pasha, the death sentences have been passed. The accused have confessed. Even Ataturk's former trusted associates fall victim to his purge. There will be no mercy not even for old comrades. 19 death sentences are carried out, and dozens are found guilty of various crimes and sent into exile. 
the opposition is significantly weakened. Even after the uprisings against his dictatorial reign, Ataturk continues his efforts to fundamentally change Turkish society. His last great project is the reform of language and the written word. Arabic letters are replaced with Latin ones within a short space of time, and Arabic and Persian words are replaced by authentic Turkish expressions. As a result, many Turks are only able to read the newspapers with the help of a dictionary. Within a single generation, the books of the past become incomprehensible. Ataturk himself attempts to educate the people. The former military hero is now Turkey's teacher-in-chief. To me and to many other historians of the era, the language reform is the most significant. Abolishing the use of Arabic writing served two purposes. To break the ties to the Islamic world, which of course was unacceptable to Ataturk's opponents. At the same time, it vastly encouraged the rise of literacy. It's an unprecedented effort. Despite the first indications of the growing international economic crisis, the president continues to pursue industrialization and education reform. He travels the country in an attempt to understand the daily lives of Turkey's largely agricultural population and to develop a national economic program. Ataturk also invites foreign experts to help Turkey make the transition to a modern, industrialized society. The speed of the reforms is too great for much of the Turkish population, and many feel they are being forced to participate against their will. Ataturk is unwilling to accept this. I am not a dictator. They say I have power. Yes, that is true. There is nothing that I could wish for and not make a reality. However, I do not act with force and injustice. And a dictator is someone who suppresses the self-determination of others. I want to rule by capturing the hearts of the people, not by breaking them. With the introduction of the surname law in 1934, which brings Turkey's naming system in line with European conventions, Mustafa Kemal finally becomes Ataturk, father of the Turks. A flood of glorifying images and memorials ensues, a cult of personality typical of the era. Ataturk statues are still found throughout modern Turkey, even though his party and Kemalism in general have fallen out of political favor. He was convinced that he was the only person who could make this project a reality and that no one else could share this task. He was convinced of the uniqueness of his mission, which could not be carried out by others. And he believed he had to give absolutely everything to fulfill this mission. In 1927, Ataturk moves to Istanbul and begins to spend more and more time on his yacht. Responsibility for the day-to-day -day business of the government is increasingly placed in the hands of his future successor, Ismet Inunu. He has battled illness since the war and his health problems are exacerbated by excessive alcohol consumption. In the winter of 1937, doctors determine that he is suffering from cirrhosis of the liver. As the celebrations of the 15th anniversary of the Republic draw to a close in 1938, Ataturk lies bedridden in Istanbul's Dolmabahce Palace, his final residence. He had hoped to join in the festivities. On its way back from the celebrations in Istanbul, a ship carrying military cadets passes the palace and the young soldiers sing the national anthem. Ataturk is said to have had tears in his eyes. Soon after, on the 10th of November, 1938, Ataturk dies in Istanbul at 9.05 a.m. 
Turkey marks the moment of his death with a minute silence every year. The clock in the room he died in still shows the time the father of modern Turkey passed away. The entire country mourns during his funeral, and the country's leaders prepare for a future Turkey without Ataturk, but shaped by his guiding principles. Fifteen years pass before Ataturk's body is transferred to its final resting place, the mausoleum in Ankara. Rarely has a politician changed a society so dramatically in such a short period of time. However, his reforms traumatized a population rooted in tradition and religion, and the effects are still felt today. Ataturk and his revolution are currently of great significance because Turkey is moving away from Ataturk's vision of a republic and towards a more presidential system. It is therefore particularly important to remember Ataturk's achievements and the effort that went into making them a reality. You don't necessarily have to love the father, but you can't deny that he stands at the beginning of this modern nation. One of his greatest achievements was making women visible. In modern-day Turkey, Ataturk has become a symbol. He represents the hopes of the people who are dissatisfied with the country's current leadership and government. I see many more Ataturk images now than I used to. Ataturk, visionary, revolutionary, reformer. He made Turkey the country it is today, a modern, vibrant, yet divided nation-state on the border between East and West.